thank you very much, and thank you very much for this invitation. And um, besides what uh, Mad had talked here about what I've been doing, I've been working quite a lot with livestock and environment, especially on climate change and nutrients, and this is what I am going to focus on here. And um, I'm sure some of you have heard about this uh, concept of the planetary boundaries that uh, the group around Rockström and Will Steffen has established and are working on. It's a kind of concept to do a pedag pedagogical view of how we human interact and which boundaries we have here on planet Earth. And the basis here is that there are nine processes or systems that are so crucial for the planet that we have to stay within some boundaries. And uh, I will come to this later on, but you have, for example, chemical pollution, we have nutrient cycling, we have uh, acidification of the oceans. So there are systems or processes that are absolutely vital and we should stick into some boundaries. And my, what I've been thinking about here is, how is livestock coming into this place here? And uh, this is talked as one of the big um, challenges, because as we said here before, there is going to be consumption changes. And it's not only population growth, but it's also when people get healthier, they eat more rich food and they eat more animals, animal food. And this is uh, from 1960 to 2050, so the last 50 years is a prognosis from the FO. And uh, you can see here, for example, if you look at the total over there, the big, big uh, production increase between 1960 until today. And also that there is a prognosis for quite a big uh, increase in future. And we can also see that there is a trend here that there is pig and poultry that is going to increase relatively much more than cattle and also lamb. And um, here we have milk and egg, the similar years. And uh, it's very much that livestock production and consumption is actually now a driver for uh, when we are growing, uh, what we are growing in our croplands. And here is the prognosis for cereal consumption. If we look from today, the blue staple for the whole world, and to uh, 2050, there is a 50% increase in, in the prognosis. So 50% uh, more, more, more yields should be needed. And this can always be discussed, and these prognoses are very uncertain, because uh, how do you measure what people will eat in future? And for, for example, one thing, will the people in the developing country eat as much meat and will all people in, uh, sorry, in developed country and will all people in the developing country take after this pattern? So there are, there are lots of questions around this, but this is some type of prognosis that is often used. And if you look at all type of literature, you can just wind up and say that there are a lot of problems with world food production already today. Just if you read all type of, of papers, you can see that we have greenhouse gases, uh, food production uses, agriculture uses, most of the land use is the dominant land user of the land of the planet. Losses of biodiversity, nitrogen, phosphorus, and we use chemicals in forms of pesticides and also um, uh, for uh, medicines for animals in a growing extent. And if we go look at the global greenhouse gas emissions from the latest IPCC report, we have the green uh, sector up there. It's agriculture and forestry. They are of often given together. And it's about 25%, one-fourth of total emission that are in the, these sectors. But this is actually not enough because we have also energy use in, in uh, industry and in transports. So if you would include that, the sector would actually be bigger. And it's also a question here how much of this forestry and land use change that should be attributed to, to agriculture. But in all ways, in any way, we have, we have a significant contributor here for, for the emissions. And uh, the evidence are very clear. We can see on the right how the uh, um, concentration in the atmosphere for carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide has increased very much since pre-industrial time. 
And uh, if we look at the, how the emissions were distributed in 2010, if we calculate them in carbon dioxide equivalents, it's far, far now that the carbon dioxide is, of course, the most important. But these methane and nitrous oxide, which I used to call food and agricultural greenhouse gases, are also quite significant. And uh, the thing here, I'm sure so most of you have uh, come to understand this. Uh, when we started to talk so much about climate change and emissions around 2008, 2009, I think it started as quite a big surprise for many how important food production is. And uh, we have this methane where the enteric fermentation from cattle and ruminants are, uh, are a big contributor, a very potent uh, greenhouse gas, which is about equ equivalent to around 25 kilo of CO2. And we have nitrous oxide, which is very closely related to we ha how we handle nitrogen in agriculture. And uh, if you look at the farming system, uh, and especially when we talk livestock products, actually fossil fuels from uh, CO2 from fossil fuels is not that big on the farm level. And uh, if we look here at this enteric fermentation and this fantastic process we have in our cattle and ruminants where we can use uh, cellulose and lignin and uh, um, carbon hydrates, break them down with the help of a whole bunch of this microbial community and turn them into uh, um, energy for the animals and also uh, proteins because they can build up proteins from the ammonia. And the side effect of this one is then that we have this production of, of uh, uh, hydrogen in the rumen and this hydrogen is not good for the animals and then we have methano rumen methanogens who take care of this hydrogen and turn it into methane and we have this emission of methane from the animals. This is also an energy loss, uh, loss for the animals and, and the, more, the less um, higher, lower digestibility you have in your fodder for the animals, you have higher losses of the energy because they have to digest the, the material more. But this is also a very important evolution thing for animals because when this started million years ago when the first ruminant um, category started to evolve. It was in the wild, this was really a very, very big um, uh, um, advantage to be able to use all type of, of uh, green material and digest it into uh, proteins and growth and milk. However, uh, I, I am out talking quite a lot about um, livestock and, uh, and climate change and and I always get the question, it's a very common question, this is such a natural process, what's the problem with this methane? And that is true, it is a very prop, uh, natural process. What, what is a bit unnatural now, it's the high number of, of ruminants on the world. And here is cattle, how they have increased from around 400 million in the late 1800. Today, about 1.5 billion. And if we also add to here the sheep and goats and some uh, buffalo, we come up in a total of around 3.7 billion of, uh, of domestic ruminants to produce our me meat and, uh, and uh, milk. And just to, have to give you a comparison, there is around 75 million of wild ruminants on the planet. So there is a big, 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 big change here, uh, difference here. And... Um, and uh, we can also look, I have tried to get historical data and how much cattle we had, and I have found some data from the 1500 that it was around maybe 100 million. So the increase and, and change here is enormous. And uh, the FO have done quite a lot of work on, on looking at this uh, livestock sector and its greenhouse gas emissions. And here is from their latest uh, report, which I think is very well done, and they have used a very consistent methodology to look at the feed intake of different animals, which I think is uh, among the best on the world, in the world in methods now. And if we look at the total from the livestock sector now, it's about 7 gigaton carbon dioxide equivalents. Around 65% of these come from cattle, and if we add the small ruminants and buffalo, uh, as much as 80% come from ruminants. 
So when we are talking about greenhouse gas emissions and how we are going to lo lower them in the future, we must, we must actually address the ruminants. This is a bit of a complicated picture, and it's also from, it's from the FO, and I see if I can mm, help you through this. How do you get a, a red spot here? Is anyone knowing? I have to a point. I have to be a bit practical here. Uh, I shall help you through here. When you do this type of carbon footprinting, or you calculate how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions there is in the life cycle of a product, you calculate it into carbon dioxide equivalents because you can, you can have the uh, different types of uh, indicators to see how they affect the, uh, the, um, how much, um, how much the um, radiation is um, uh, impacted by this uh, concentration increase of, of, of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, for example, as I said before, methane has 25. It's very short-lived, uh, very short-lived greenhouse gases. But, but the time when it's in the atmosphere is very, very potent. And uh, the blue one here is the uh, enteric uh, methane from the enteric fermentation. If you look here on Western Europe, the milk here, you can see it's quite small share of the total footprint. But if we look at LAC, which is Latin America, and if we look at uh, south Af uh, southern uh, south of uh, Sahara, it's a very big share of the methane, that, of the total carbon footprint that is methane. And we can also see that nit nitrous oxide from the use of, of both manure and of fertilizer is really quite important. But what we can see here is that there is quite a big variation. And, and uh, what they did was they took this uh, data and put into this diagram and on this diagram, we have the uh, carbon footprint on here, this axis. And here we have the intensity, how much eat the output per cow. That is the average yield per cow. And each dot is a country here. And I think it's very interesting when you see this picture here, where you really think it's, it's a lot of science should go in. It's where we have the countries that are uh, lying around here. If we could do some in a short time, some good positive impact here to get a, bi a bit of yield intensity increase here. That would do quite a lot for the carbon footprint. While we are looking up here at 4,000, 8,000 kilo milk per cow, and ongoing intensification is not always as good for, for the carbon footprint because you have to add more concentrates, etc., and that costs uh, emissions. And um, I am just look here at milk yields in Sweden. I think it's quite interesting how, it has, how fast this has actually happened in Sweden. This is the milk yield per cow and year on average. And uh, here in the 1920s, 30s, we were lying around 2,000, 2,500 in average. That is where many countries are today. And you can see how fast this development has gone. And this is, of course, an effect of all type of things of better knowledge, better feed, better management, very much genetics. And I showed this picture once and I got the question, how much, how much is, um, how much is um, this due to uh, fertilizers, N fertilizers? And I had to think, how much is this development up to N fertilizers? And the funny thing there, the cow up there is actually an organic cow, milking 10,000 kilo milk per year. Uh, it's from my neighbor, I live on the countryside, and it, they have uh, this extremely well-kept farm with extremely, I must say, I'm so impressed every time I get there because they have pastures and grassland that are really so productive and high-quality feed for the animals. So um, uh, I couldn't answer the question, how much was this due to end fertilizer, but I think it is very much to management and feed quality and also genetics. So coming back here, looking here on science to work where we have the cattle and dairy production in this area should be, a, my, as I see, high priority. And listening to Jim here, I do understand that this is, of course, a complex thing. It's not about only about feeding, but also how the whole system, how to integrate it with market. 
and also to get the knowledge out to use the uh, technology to do that because that is not advanced technology at all. And I will also say that when we come up here, we talked about intensification and maybe de-intensification. Myself now, because I have studied dairy production quite a lot, and I'm starting to think that maybe we should start to de-intensificate when we get up to these cows here. And when I say that, I get slammed in the head, so <laughs> we don't have to take more about that now. Uh, here is the same from FO, and this is from beef production of the world. And again, we can see Western Europe, and now we have the carbon footprint per kilo of carcass weight. This is the normal way of calculating, that is meat with bones. And we can see that Western Europe, in average, are relatively low. And that is very much due to we have a big dairy production in, 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 in Western Europe. So we have a lot of um, surplus calves and also uh, cows that are slaughtered that are dairy cows that have produced both milk and beef, which I see as a quite um, nice way of doing this type of, of um, food, uh, animal products. And we have LAC here, Latin America, and you see the methane, the, the part of methane here is very, very high of the staple. And this is partly because they don't have much dairy, it's pure beef, but it's also very much about animal management. And um, this is from a travel I did in, in, in Brazil, and I think here is one of the so important things to work about is degra degradation of pastures, which you see quite a lot in, in South America. And uh, on the right side, uh, a farm with the most perfect pasture, and we have a completely different production. What happens here, because there is poorer feed quality, so the, the, the animals will emit more methane just because the, the feed is poor, but it will also take much longer for the calves to be, in, to have a, to, to be pregnant and to deliver a new, ca a new calf. The slaughter ages will be very high up. So in the total herd system, you have many herds, many animals to get out one kilo of beef. And uh, while this farm here, which had an, this particular farm, integrated pasture with soybeans and maize, so this farm had a much more integrated approach. So the soybeans made use of the pasture because they had much, much, less, um, much less weeds. And the pasture growing after the soybean took up the nitrogen. So it was really a very, very good land management. And you could produce so much more beef or dairy milk on, per hectare on such a system. And this is important because if we look at the drivers of uh, deforestation, uh, beef is one important in South America, and soybeans is the other one, and both are closely connected to livestock and um, livestock production. And if we look at today at the land use change emission that is emitted, it's about 10% of total carbon dioxide emissions. And actually, there is some positive news here in this area because these emissions have actually gone down. Brazil have, in the last five years, done very good on decreasing deforestation. But it's still a driver in South America, and there are other countries that, for example, the soybeans are really expanding a lot. And this is due to, uh, I will come to that a little later here. So just taking this up, this part, uh, this picture is from New Zealand, which I think has a very interesting pasture-based system for dairy. And um, one of my PhDs and, and I, we did quite extensive work on comparing a typical North European dairy system with the New Zealand dairy system. So I can say for sure, they milk about 4,500, 5,000 kilo milk per cow and year, and they are really a little lower in carbon footprint and hardly any pesticides. It's a very, very nice production. So you don't have to go so extremely high to be efficient, but you have to have an efficient land use. And I think that this is one of the handling this methane so they don't get so big from the livestock so sector. It's very much about how we handle feed resource. And this is, of course, important for food security. It will give, give us less greenhouse gas emissions per kilo milk or beef. 
and it saves land and does save forests. In my world, who do environmental science, I think this is one of the top things that we have to look a lot into. Uh, I will now come to a bit more about porks and um, poultry. And again, FO, uh, they do a lot. Of, I have done some work for them around this carbon footprint, but I think they have done a lot of great things the last years about to understand these livestock systems. And um, this is how they usually try to do some type of classification of the livestock production of systems of the world. And then you have subsystem, but this is in a very broad base. We have this grass-based system, which I have shown you and talked about. And then we have industrialized systems, and uh, they are also call called landless systems. And that sounds a bit difficult, because you have to have land to grow fodder for the animals. But that is actually a very, very uh, specialized farm, who principally only have the animals and buy in all the feed. And then we have a mixed system, uh, where we have a better crops and animal interaction, and most feed is produced on the farm. And uh, just to show you the principles here, if we have this dairy farm, which could be a dip typical dairy farm here in northwest Sweden, we have uh, grass and uh, some cereals, and that feed goes into the animals, and the manure is stored, and the manure goes back to the fields, and we have a nutrient cycling on the farm. It could be very good, it could be a bit less good. It depends very much on how much feed is brought in. And this industrial animal production, the definition is obvious, it's actually that more than 90% of the feed is coming into the farm from outside. And that means that you have a huge input of nutrients and in the fodder, and you also get a lot of manure, and you have not so much land to use it on. And uh, this, there are lots of numbers on this one, but if we look at the tif the, on, on the um, global production today, as, as FO has, has uh, estimated it, what we can see is now that uh, pork, egg production, and chicken is actually quite big in this industrial, industrial animal systems. And the prognosis now, as I said when I started here, that um, uh, pork especially, and also be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, chicken meat, but also pork will increase a lot. And it's typically that that will do in this type of industrialized systems. This picture here is from long, Livestock Long Shadow. And the red of the area, the more pigs per square kilometer. <laughs> and when you look at this uh, picture, you can really see how concentrated animal production for us pigs have become. And, and pig meat is the biggest uh, global meat production today. We have a center up here in, in northwest of Europe. Uh, then we have two states. Two, there are two parts of the United States, and, and it's, I always mix if it's, I think it's North Carolina, but it could be South Carolina, and Iowa. They have a, a big number of all the pig production in the United States. And then we have China, where we now have half of the world's pig. It has grown tremendously the last 20 years. <clears throat> due to their increased consumption. And there is a lot of flow now going of soybeans from uh, South America to uh, China. Actually, China has become the largest importer of soybeans in the world. And after that is EU, EU uh, here in Europe. So the drivers now of, of soybean expansion is actually China and EU very much. Now, what's happening here is that when we put feed into a animal, uh, the animal grows and puts milk or meat and muscles, and then we take away the animal from the farm to slaughter. And actually what happens then is that the minor part of the nutrients is in the products, that is the meat, the, the, the carcass weight, the live weight animals leaving the farm. And actually most of it ends up in the manure. Uh, it can be for phosphorus around 50 to 90 percent depends on a lot of things, intensity and if you feed fetus, etc. For nitrogen, if you have a very good uh, pig, pig uh, stable, you can maybe have like 35% in the product, 65% in the manure. But the bottom line here is that there is a very large nutrient flows from, from the feed to the, um, to the um, manure. 
And uh, what happens here is that we get this um, uh, not circulating the nutrients, but we get one flow. And one example of an effect of this is how we now are increasing the phosphorus in the cropland in the EU27. And this is just a balance where you can see both the input as ton total and in per hectare and year. And the interesting thing here is that uh, if you look here, we have a bigger input of, of uh, phosphorus from the manure than in the fertilizers. But when we look what we put out in the products, you can see that we have a quite a big surplus in average. This surplus, a small part of that, will be um, lost through erosion or through leaching, but most of it will actually start to um, um, accumulate in the soil, so we are getting higher and higher phosphorus. And uh, I, I think I'm a bit surprised. I think that this is not so much discussed as it should be, because, because of this, how we organize our animal production system, we actually use more fertilizers than we should need if we have the better nutrient cycling. Because the phosphorus is, after all, a, 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 an infinite resource. And, uh, for example, there are many areas in Af Africa where we actually would need this fertilizer so much better to improve the, the status of the soils. So this, I think, is some kind of, of, of fairness. We have a system here that actually don't, don't think about how we accumulate phosphor in our soils. And the same thing here with nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen, will, if we accumulate, we don't accumulate nitrogen in the soil because we, if we have a surplus, which we certainly have when we have much animals, this will go up in the air or it will leach much of it. And this picture is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment where we have tried to look at where can we find um, water in the water system, in the flood and in the creeks and the rivers, how much water is transported, that is the leaching from fields and also from uh, the sewage plants. And the darker the color, the higher nitrogen transports are. And you can see very well here that, well, that these, um, these dark areas coincide with very intensive, um, very intensive farming, but also very intensive livestock farming. And this one is kind of funny. Um, it's, um, I, have a, I have a PhD student who's interested in data, and, and now you can get, uh, you can put data from FO, gridded livestock, where are the livestock, and you can take data from Eurostat to try to understand why, where are the animals. And here, for example, are pigs in Europe. It's not, not just that they are, they are uh, uneven distributed all over, but also in country, for example, in Germany, which is the country in, in, in Europe that have the most pigs. Uh, half of all the pigs are up in two of the states up in the northwest, close to Holland. So there is an extreme concentration up there. And of course, they can't provide with fodder for all these pigs, so you have to import. And that's also the case why most of these areas are located close to harbors. Now I'm going to finish this up, and I think that another big, big in importance here is how we are going to improve nutrient cycling in, in, uh, in our livestock production, and how we are going to use the manure. And I think this will be a big challenge as pork and um, chicken meat is growing. And when I talk about these things, I have realized that you can have see, to look at it on two sides, and I... I there is a kind of a value, value, how you see on values. If you are very positive to technology and you think that technology will fix a lot, you can say like this, it's very good that we have this concentration and that we have big farms because in that case we can invest in new technology and we can take care of the manure and process it into some type of fertilizer. That's a one way of seeing it. Another way of seeing it is that we should have much more um, uh, much more balance in our system and don't have this concentration and specialization, but rather have it have uh, animals on more, f more farms and see, see that we have a relation between animals and land that is uh, good enough. I will not say w uh, what is best, but I think we should have much more research on this area. How are we going to develop system for livestock and especially pig and pork? 
pig and sorry, I say for all pig and chicken meat that uh, actually see that we get good nutrient cycling here. And for example, this is a very modern storing capacity from Sweden, so we can store it. But if we don't have so much land to spread it on, we would still have a problem. So, so there, there, is, there is really to look at the whole system here. We have much, much have, must have much more system analysis. And I, I, I think I'm quite surprised that this is not discussed more. Okay, I will finish here. And, uh, I think that how the world livestock sector will develop, there are so many major challenges here. And if we come back to this planetary boundary, where this researcher who's working on this have identified that there are some boundaries now that are well overpassed, biodiversity losses, cycling of nitrogen and climate change and also phosphorus. And I know from a newer version now that they are discussing also land. And it's just to say that agriculture and especially livestock production is very much into these, uh, these um, boundaries that are transgressed. Biodiversity losses, this is very much associated with land expansion and we often talk about land expansion in the, in the um, South America. But it's also land intensification I, and I think that in a kind of way we now have a second wave of, of losing biodiversity also here in Europe. We have big um, population dips of birds, for example. We have this problem with, with, with bees and pollinating insects. So this intensification, land intensification, is actually very, very important to look at, at also. We have this disturbance of the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. And if you look at every year how much uh, new nitrogen and phosphorus that goes into the big, uh, big planet system, it's actually so much is associated with food production. It's nitrogen, 70% of the nitrogen through the fertilizers and the um, uh, leguminous. And phosphorus is about 85% of the taking out of virgin phosphorus go into agriculture. So we, we, if we are going to address these uh, cycles, we have to look at, at nutrients and we have to look at how we organize livestock. And of course, emission of greenhouse gases where if we look at only livestock today, they are around 15% of total emissions. So by this I will thank you, and I will end this, even if I say there are many, I like cattle, and this is an uh, art <laughs> from uh, Varnos Guts in Knislinge in Skåne. It's an American uh, uh, artist, Maja Lin, who have done this, and she has been uh, inspired by, there is this, um, uh, serpent uh, in Ohio. Are you from America? This is a very, very old Indian thing that I have found, which is like a thousand years before Christ. And she was inspired by this and took it to Varnus Goods. And uh, there are about 300 cows on this farm, and they are into this art because they go in and out before they go out to the pastures. They have to pass this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.